Hi class, greetings from Idaho, where I am today. Um, today, since I'm not in class, we're gonna do this video uh, via YouTube. So, our learning objectives are as follows. First, we're gonna define what are one-dimensional defects. So last class we talked about point defects, now we're gonna go from point zero dimensions to one-dimensional defects, right? Um, such as edge and screw dislocations. When we talk about those, we're going to define some critical vocab like the burgers vector and the dislocation direction and how these are related to the two different types of one-dimensional dislocations. We'll talk about two-dimensional defects like um, stacking faults and twinning. Um, we'll differentiate between grain boundaries and domains. And then at the end of class, we're going to talk about what are some different microscopy techniques that we can use to try and visualize some of these different types of defects. Um, and how can we use them to maximize contrast for different grains, elements, and, what, and everything else. So let's pick up where we left off last time, which was talking about defects, right? Point defects. Let's do a quick reminder. So first off, if you took niobium 5 plus and you were going to try and insert it in a titanium dioxide lattice, first question is, is this going to be substitutional or interstitial? And the main thing that matters here is size. There's a couple rules that played a role, but size is going to be the most important. And if you look at the size of niobium 5 plus and titanium, and what is the charge is going to be 4 plus because you've got two oxygens, so minus 2 times 2 is the minus 4. That means titanium must be 4 plus. Niobium 5 plus and ti titanium 4 plus are pretty close to the same size. Uh, we could look that up in a, in a size chart. Okay, so titanium 4 plus, let's assume that it's octahedral um, because it is in TiO2. Its size is about 0 0.605. Niobium 5 plus, if it were to sit on that same size, 0.64. So, you know, it's very, very close. Uh, so it's very likely going to be substitutional as opposed to interstitial. If it was way, way smaller, like carbon and nitrogen and hydrogen, things like that, they can tend to be more interstitial. So, okay, so it's probably going to be substitutional. That's the first question, the first part of this. Now, the next one is what type of defect will it produce? Well, think about what happens when you put a niobium 5 plus on a titanium 4 plus site. What does that do to the net charge balance here? Well, niobium 5 plus on a titanium 4 plus site has excess positive or negative. It has excess positive charge by 1. Okay. So to fix that, we have two options when it comes to defects. We could either we either one we can add negative add negative charge. The way that we would accomplish this is with something like an oxygen interstitial. Interstitial. Or the other option is to remove positive. And the way that we're going to remove positive is by forming additional vacancies in this well, vacancies in the structure on the titanium sites, right? TI4 plus vacancies. Okay, those are our two options. So which one's going to be favorable? Forming interstitials or vacancies? Vacancies are always favored, right? Now both are going to happen, but you're going to have more uh, vacancies than interstitials because interstitials require you to cram an extra atom in that lattice, and that's going to be difficult because it's going to push other atoms out of the way. It's going to cost more energy. Whereas pulling an atom out, it does cost energy, right? Because that breaks bonds and things, but it's generally less energy. So vacancies are almost always favored. Now the problem is for every one niobium that we put on, on a titanium four plus site, that is an excess positive of one. But if we remove one titanium atom, we remove four charges. So it's not balanced. So what should this be? Let's start writing this out, okay? So titanium oxide, TiO2, that formula is going to get modified to be, let's call it niobium x, so x amount of niobium. For every x amount of niobium that we add, first off, titanium would be, at first glance, you'd say, oh, that's 1 minus x, O2. Or in other words, for every niobium you put on a titanium site, 
if there was one to start with, this is balanced out, right? X here, one minus X here. But that would not account for the vacancies that we have to form. So this really needs to be, we're gonna modify this and we're gonna say, okay, there's the one for the substitution, and then for every four substitutions, we need a vacancy. So it's gonna be minus X over four, O2, right? And you could obviously combine those together. So rewriting this, niobium X titanium one minus five X fourths oxygen two. That would be the defect formula for this, right? Okay, and there's lots of examples I've put on YouTube that you can watch of this. Now, here's a question I have is, what would be a point defect in a polymer, right? We talked about point defects like Frankel and Schottky defects. We talked about substitutions, things like that. What would that look like in a polymer, right? Well, a point defect might be, let's say you've got your chain of carbon atoms in a simple structure, say polyethylene. So polyethylene, remember all of these side groups, which I'm just writing as dashes, are actually hydrogens, right? So it's CH2s all the way along this chain. What would a point defect look like? Well, it might look like something other than a CH2 link along the chain. For example, what if you had an inserted a floor polymer, right? Something that would have looked like Teflon, right? Instead of carbon bonded to two hydrogens, maybe in one spot on the chain, and it's not repeated, it's just in a single spot, it has the wrong thing bonded in, the wrong monomer. So that'd be like a point defect, right? Or maybe if you have head to tail, right? If instead of this, let's say that the repeat unit is this, okay, that's not a defect. But as you go from chain to chain to chain, maybe you go head to tail, head to tail, head to tail, but then all of a sudden you do head to head, right? One of these is switched, right? These things are normally reversed, but it gets switched. These you could start to think of as point defects because they occur in one spot and they're not continuous in one direction or two directions or, or anything else, okay? All right, this finally brings us now to uh, line defects, things that are not point defects, but rather that continue in one dimension like a line, okay? And one of the easiest way to do to see this is with these bubble raft pictures, right? So in this image here, this is what's called a bubble raft. So as you look at this, does this look like a perfect lattice? Hopefully, if you're looking at it, you can see that it's not perfect. For example, take a look at this. There's that big hole here. Let me switch to a different color. Okay, you've got a hole right here, right? A missing atom right there. So that's not perfect. That's a defect around that spot. What else is wrong with this? You see that there's this small little hole here. So what's going on there? That's not the same because here, the symmetry is sort of preserved around the defect, right? You've got this hexagonal pattern going around it, and it's a hexagonal lattice. But here, take a look at this, it's, it's not that. It's now a pentagon. So something's wrong here. Some, some sort of defect is at play. What's happening here is there's a line defect. And the easiest way to see this is to draw lines through the rows of atoms. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to draw a line through this row of atoms extending all the way through the picture, okay? Now let's do the one right next to it. See what's happened here? I drew a line and at that point there's a split. It splits and then there's an extra half a row of atoms tucked in here. Here's the extra half a row of atoms. See that? If we go over you can see that this defect, this one-dimensional defect, which again we call a dislocation, can be thought of as a extra half row of atom, atoms that gets put into the lattice. And you can also see that in the vicinity of the defect, the distortion is pretty large. These things are really pushed out of the way. But far away from it, it starts to look normal again, right? If you get further and further away from the defect, it looks more and more like the nice hexagonal lattice that you'd expect right? Far enough away. It's just in the near vicinity that it gets broken up a little bit, okay? So when you do these defects, something that's helpful to uh, talk about them is by doing something called the Berger circuit, right? The Berger circuit is as follows, okay? Okay, so pick a different color. Let's do red. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to trace a circuit around this defect and what we're going to see is that it doesn't quite match up. So let's start by going um, one, two, three, right? I went three atom positions. One, well, I covered three atoms. I went two atoms over, I guess you could say. Let's do three. Let me redraw that. So I'm going to go one, two, three atoms over. I'm going to go one, two, three atoms up. I'm going to go one, one, two, three atoms up there. One, two, three, one, two, three. And then take a look at this. If I go one, two, three, I don't end where I started, right? I don't end up where I started. That is a telltale sign that you have a dislocation. When you did a circuit around it, you find that you don't end where you started. And the amount that you're off by um, is right here. That is our burger's vector. We would have to travel that additional distance to get back where we started. So that is our burger's vector. Okay. Whereas if you did the same thing anywhere else, let's do one, two, three, 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 one, two, three. I end up right where I started. So it's just around these one-dimensional dislocations that you get the burger's vector forming. Okay. And I've shown you here that it's because of this extra row of atoms, okay? And then you end up with this distance between where you end and where you thought you were going to end, okay? Now, this Berger's vector, depending on which way it's oriented relative to the dislocation, will change what type of dislocation you have. What do I mean by that? Well, take a look here. You can see here, if these were rows of atoms that these lines represent, you can see this dark line, that represents the dislocation, the, the extra half row of atoms. Let's do that in red. This one right here, that's the extra half row that got stuffed into this lattice, and it created a distortion around it. So if we did our Berger's vector analysis, we'd see that for that one, the Berger's vector would be along that direction, right? Just like they've shown here. That's our Berger's vector, okay? But that is going perpendicular to the direction of the dislocation line. So the dislocation line, it travels up and down all the way through this material, right? That, that extra half row of atoms travels all the way up and down through this material. So B, the vector B representing our Berger's vector, it is orthogonal, it's perpendicular to the direction of the dislocation, right? If they're perpendicular, we call this an edge dislocation. Okay, that's an edge dislocation. But there's another type of def defect that we can create. So imagine this one now. Okay, this time the dislocation travels up and down through the material just like before, but the type of dislocation is not an edge because it's now, it's like a parking garage. Like every time you go up a level, you're above where you started before. So as you, as you trace around this and go 360 degrees, by the time you get back where you started, you've gone up one level, okay? Or in other words, the Berger's vector now is vertical. It's along the same direction as the dislocation line. So the Berger's vector is now parallel to the line of the dislocation. Okay, can you see that here? That this parking garage, if I was to start down here, if I was to do my Berger's circuit, I would end up above where I started. Or going the other way, I'd end up below it. Therefore, the dislocation, the amount to end up where I started, has to go up or down. But that's the direction of the dislocation. It also goes up and down. Let's show you this with a diagram. Okay, in this picture you can see a crystal lattice and hopefully you can see that it looks a bit like a parking garage. You can start out here, right? And as you were wind around, you end up back down underneath it to end. Okay, see that? See how there's a parking garage? So the defect travels through the material like this, right? it travels along this line. And each time that you go, it's like a corkscrew that you're creating this defect. Can you see that? So in either case, you can have a Berger's vector, which represents, again, the displaced atoms, which has the, the same length, but it can have a different direction. 
And then if that dislocation right, line lines up with the burger's vector, you have what's called a screw dislocation. If it's perpendicular to it, you get an edge dislocation. Okay. Um, what do these things look like at an atomic level? Well, if you've seen corn, then you've seen them, right? Anytime that you've eaten corn, you've probably noticed that they don't line up perfectly. Instead, you've got this extra half row of kernels in there, right? Which allows you to accommodate the changing volume of the, of the corn on the cob shape. So what does that look like for atoms? Well, here you have this nice um, atom arrangement, and far away from the dislocation, it kind of looks nice and normal. It looks like a square. But in the vicinity of it, it starts doing funny things, right? These are very distorted. They're not at the right angle that they'd like to be at. Um, their coordination number changes, right? Count coordination number. So for this atom, it is coordinated by, let's switch colors, by one, two, three, four atoms. But take a look at this one in, in the middle here. It's coordinated by, well, kind of, kind of by these five atoms, right? So it changes the local bonding environment from what it wants to be to something that it doesn't want to be. And so that's going to change the energy. In fact, dislocations cost energy, right? That shoving this extra half row of atoms in here, it costs energy. Think about what it does in terms of strain, right? If we think about strain only for a minute, then this region down here is under tension or compression. And this region up here, is it under tension or compression? Well, you stuffed an extra half row of atoms into the lattice. So this is going to be compression, right? Compression as opposed to tension. And then on the other hand, this one, because you stuffed that atom row up above it, they're being pulled apart more than they'd like to. So it's under tension. Okay. So it creates strain fields that surround the dislocation above it. You get compression below it. You get tension. Okay. Here's again the, the screw dislocation, how if you do the burger circuit around, again, they travel one, two, three, four, then they do four in the other direction, four in the final direction, and to end up where they started, they had to travel back down. So the burger's vector is parallel all in the same direction of the plane. Okay. Now what's interesting is that dislocations, they can change directions. They don't have to travel straight all the way through the material. They can bend and curve through the material. So for example, if this blue line here, if that represents what the dislocation is doing in your material, take a look at it. On this end over here, you've got the extra half plane of atoms. That's very clearly an edge dislocation. And your Burger's vector, right here, that's your Burger's vector, is orthogonal. It's perpendicular to the line of that extra half row of atoms, which is traveling that way, right? So edge dislocation, definitely. But that same dislocation can move and curve. And now over here, there's your Burger's vector, but it's traveling along the same direction of the dislocation. So it can go from edge dislocation and all the way to screw, and it can change character. It doesn't have to be just one. So we call these mixed dislocations when they do that. Okay. Now what would the Burger's vector be equal to? In these drawings, you can see one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. What is the Burger's vector equal to? It's equal to one bond distance, right? One of these bond distances is going to be the Burger's vector in this drawing. All right, so these deformations, these sorry, these dislocations can move through a material. And in two chapters, uh, mechanical properties and then deformation, we're going to talk a lot more about it in, when we get to deformation. But for now, just realize that if you have this extra half row of atoms, they don't have to be stationary. If you apply a shear stress to this, which means again that you're applying a stress here and a stress here, so you're sort of trying to slide these past one another, what you'll see happen is that this dislocation can move through the material. right? And as it moves through the material, it has to break some bonds and then reform some bonds over here. And it can move all the way through until it pops out at the end. And take a look here. Once it pops out at the end, there's no more deformation in the lattice. It's an undeformed lattice, right? Or other way around, if you want to deform a lattice, if you want to actually physically move material, like, a like if you're a blacksmith and you're pounding on something, what you're doing is you're moving dislocations all the way through. You're propagating them through the material. And in doing so, you get some incremental in 
change in the volume of the material. It's actually changing, not volume, it's changing its dimensions by pushing atoms all the way through, okay? So we'll talk a lot more about that in two chapters. So those are one-dimensional defects. Let's now turn our attention to two-dimensional defects. So these are areas of the lattice that are not perfect, but it's not a single line that they're imperfect. It's a whole area, okay? So obviously boundaries are gonna fit this description. Anything that's a boundary, so this could be with different crystal structures, but also different orientations of the same type of structure. We'll show that in just a minute. It can be external surfaces. We've talked about this at, at length in this class, that at the external surface, you have atoms that don't have their maximum number of bonds, and so there's an enthalpy penalty that manifests itself as an energy, right? Uh, because they have fewer neighbors. This is why we talk about things as having a surface energy, something like a joules per meter squared. Um, and this is also why things typically want to minimize their surface area, right? So if you notice um, little droplets of water forming, it's because they're trying to reduce their surface area. It's lower energy for them to be surrounded by the number of atoms that they want to be surrounded by. So they form little spheres because that turns out to have the best volume per surface area ratio that you can get, okay, typically. Um, now let's talk about grain boundaries. This is a boundary in a crystal but, so it's the same type of crystal, it just has different orientation. So can you see that in this picture, right? They're typically only a few atoms thick. Well, take a look at this region. That's very clearly a region that has the same orientation, right? But now take a look at this one. That region here, right, the rows of atoms, they don't quite line up, right? Over here, take a look at this one. Right, this, these rows of atoms in that region don't quite line up. These ones don't quite line up. We could sort of go through this and we could outline the regions that look like they're nice and uniform. And what you'll notice is that between these regions you have grain boundaries, right? Along these regions it doesn't look nice and square. It's all jumbled up. And because of that, its coordination number is off. It's maybe either too close, like look, these atoms are way too close to each other. They're not happy about that. Or they're stretched too far apart and they're not gonna be happy about that. These all come with energy penalties, right? So these are called grain boundaries. They extend in two dimensions. Now they can curve just like a two dimensional surface can curve as well. So you can end up with nice, maybe spherical grains, but all around that you're gonna have grain boundaries, okay? So you can have both high and low angle ground, green boundaries possible. If the mismatch between these grains is very small, then it's a low angle. If it's a big mismatch, it's a high angle. So what does that look like? We'll take a look at this one. This is a nice example of a low angle grain boundary, right? This angle between these two, the ones that are oriented this way and the ones that are oriented just off a little bit, if that's less than about 15 degrees, then we call this a low angle grain boundary. And low angle grain boundaries, we can think of them as just a series of dislocations separated from one another. Can you see them in this picture? That in order to achieve a low angle grain boundary, what you need is some additional half rows of atoms, right? This extra half row, this extra half row, this extra half row. And so you end up with this separation distance between these dislocations. It's, you can think of a low angle grain boundary as a series of stacked dislocations along that grain boundary. Um, because it's a low angle, we can do some geometry to figure out the separation distance between these. So if this is D, the separation distance between these edge dislocations, that's going to be equal to B over theta, where B is your Burgers vector, right? That's your Burgers vector B. And then theta is defined right down here as the angle mismatch. The reason we can do that is because sine of a small angle is just equal to that angle. So the sine of five degrees is just five degrees approximately, right? That only works for small angles, not for big angles, okay? So that is these grain boundaries that you can kind of think of them as a series of aligned edge dislocations. You can see these when they actually do microscopy by the way, we're looking at atoms here, right? Rows of atoms, that's amazing. You can see there's just a bunch of extra half rows and these dislocations are pretty uniformly and evenly spaced, okay? All right, um, there's other different ways that you can have grain boundaries. For example, take a look at these ones, right? Here's the one that we just showed you where they're just aligned differently. The blue cube and the green cube are just tilted to one another. But you can also have them aligned, but then rotated, right? 
So you can see this one here. We call these twist boundaries, right? Where they would otherwise be lined up, but these things that would be perfectly aligned up, they're now twisted from one another. So that's a twist boundary. It's still a type of grain boundary because along this red surface, you're not going to have things line up, okay? So all these different types of grain boundaries, they cost energy, but they don't cost the same amount of energy. Some have, for example, more or fewer of these dislocations, and so they're going to cost more or less energy. Therefore, all surfaces were not created equal. Grain boundaries tell us that some grain boundaries are going to cost more than others. And so if a crystal is going to grow, and it has to have grain boundaries or surfaces at all, some surfaces might be preferred to others because they cost less energy. This is why crystals grow. Crystals grow with certain facets. It has these facets because these turned out to be the edges that cost the least amount of energy. They, they still cost energy, but they cost less than other energies that might have formed. Okay. Um, now, because these interfaces have energy, if you're going to put an impurity somewhere, where will it go, right? Impurities segregate to grain boundaries. Why do you think that is? The energy there makes them more active, but think about it. If you've got an atom, let's say you've got a really big impurity atom, right? The normal sizes of atoms in this lattice are something like this, right? Causes them to have this nice lattice. But now we're going to put something in here that has a very different size like a really big atom. It's going to sit right there at the grain boundary because that's already a little bit of a bigger spot, right? It's going to occupy these spots right along the dislocation on the bottom side, which was under tension, remember? So by inserting your impurity atoms at those sites, it's going to be the one that causes the least strain. I mean, can you imagine putting that same size of atom right here in the lattice somewhere? It's going to have to shove so many other atoms out of the way. So instead, impurities tend to segregate to grain boundaries, right? They act as sinks for grain boundaries. They, they settle there, okay? Um, um, now, obviously, if you have a coarse-grained versus a fine-grained material, what's the difference there? Well, a coarse-grained material has really big grains, and a fine grain is really small grains. So if you have a bunch of really small grains, then you have many, many grain boundaries. If you have really big grains, you don't have that many grain boundaries. And so if you look at energy, there's less energy for a coarse grain material because it has fewer grain boundaries. There's more energy for a fine grain material. What this leads to is that if you have a bunch of small grains all put together, and then you heat it up and you give it time and temperature, they will grow. Those grains will coalesce together because in doing so, you lower the energy of the system. This is why you get grain growth at elevated temperatures, and we'll talk more about that when we get to chapter 8 in just a few chapters. Okay. Now there's another type of boundary which you could think of as a, as a type of grain boundary because on, on both sides of it you have the same type of material and there's just a boundary, but this is a special type. It's a special type because it preserves a mirror symmetry across the boundary. So here's our twin boundaries, hence why we call them twins, right? So here's the boundary, if you can see that. Now look on both sides of that. On both sides of that you should see mirror symmetry. This atom is mirrored by that atom. This one by that one. This one by that one. Right? It preserves mirror symmetry. So twins are a special type of grain boundary. Here's another twin boundary. Right? This one. These are twinned with that. It's twinned with that. There's twin. There's twinning. Right? We call this twinning. Um, and what's interesting is that you can have two of these twins and then you're back to your original lattice, right? This orientation, this sort of rectangular orientation, is preserved over here after you have a couple of these twin boundaries. So that's a special type of uh, dislocation, or not a dislocation, of defect called a twin boundary. It's a grain boundary. We'll talk more about those with deformation in a bit. Um, you can also have stacking faults. If you remember, FCC, FCC metals stack ABC, ABC, ABC. Whereas HCP does just A, B, A, B, right? So you can have this scenario, right? You've got A, B, C, so it's looking like FCC, and then it goes A, B, but instead of C, you insert an A, right? Or in other words, these yellow atoms, if we were to draw atoms of different colors to represent the positions they're on, it should have gone yellow, green, blue, yellow, green, blue, but instead it did another layer of yellow. So that's a, it sort of preserved this mirror symmetry, the type of twin, right? 
it created a, a defect though. Okay, so these stacking faults also cost energy. It's another type of defect. Here's what you here's how you can see it, right? So over here you get yellow, green, blue, yellow, green, blue, yellow, green, blue. So this is okay. But over here, yellow, green, blue, yellow, green, yellow. So here, that's your stacking fault. And look what it does. At the junction, that interface, it's not right. It doesn't match up, right? It looks like a, some dislocations have been put in there, but they're two-dimensional as opposed to one-dimensional. So these are stacking faults. They also cost energy because they also distort the lattice. Okay. Um, you can also have phase boundaries. Up until now, we've been saying grain boundaries where they're the same crystal structure. They're just messed up along some sort of orientation or stacking. But you can have different phases, right? For example, you've got this white phase here. These white atoms form a phase. But then you could also have this phase right there where it's a white and black mixture. So if we were to look at these as atoms, um, this could be pure atom A out here. But this would represent a compound AB where the B atoms are the black atoms and A are the white. So if that different compound forms and it has, and thermodynamics says it's not soluble, so it's actually forming, it's gonna segregate and there's gonna be a boundary around it, right? Now, that can be different types of boundaries. They can be coherent or, in, or incoherent or semi-coherent. So for example, I will talk about this more a little bit later, but you see how these bonds are sort of stretched around this one? This is pure A and then pure B forms. Whereas over here, it's mostly still bonded. They've, they've drawn these little bond lines, right? The bonds still exist. They're maybe just a little bit stretched. So we call this a coherent boundary or a semi-coherent one. But over here, there's no bonds drawn, right? These are not drawn because they don't match up anymore. So that's an incoherent phase boundary. So all these different types of boundaries, coherent versus incoherent, all that, they all cost different energies, right? but those are all phase boundaries. Now the last type of two-dimensional defect that we're gonna talk about um, is a ferromagnetic domain or domains. So what on earth are domains? How are they different than grains? Well, within a grain, let's say you've got some big region of your crystal where it's all oriented the same direction, right? All of your atoms are lined up just so in some sort of grain boundary. Well, within that grain boundary, you can still get different things happening. For example, let's, took, let's take magnetic moments. Let's say that you have a magnetic material, so your little atoms are contributing a magnetic moment. So you've got that magnetic moment, and it might be pointed a certain direction. So up here, they might all be pointed this way. But there might be something that happens, and they might switch their directions. And over here, they're pointed different directions. Notice this is all still happening within the same grain of a material. So this isn't a different grain. This is all one grain, but you've clearly got one domain over here and one domain over here, and they don't have to point the same direction. Okay? So that's what these uh, magnetic domains are. You can have, other than magnetic domains, you can have electric domains, where now instead of a magnetic you know, dipole pointing a certain direction, it could be an electric dipole. An electric dipole is something like a shifted molecule. So overall through the lattice, the molecules might be shifted a little bit this way, but somewhere else in the lattice, they might be shifted a little bit the other way. Those would be two different domains of ferroelectric dipoles, right? Um, okay. And then lastly, you can have three-dimensional defects, right? These can be things like cracks, a pore in your material where these different grains started to grow. When they grew together, there was a, a leftover spot, like a little air pocket. You can have inclusions, maybe a secondary phase, dust particles that were in it. All of these can be different three-dimensional defects, okay? So now we come to the last part of today's class, which is how do we actually uh, examine these impurities in materials, right? So first off, you could use your human eye, and your human eye can see down to between maybe 10 to 50 microns, somewhere around there, depending on how good your vision is. So how thin is that? Well, a single hair in your head is about 10 to 20 microns, and that's about as small as the, the naked eye can see. If you want to go smaller, you have to use microscopes. So in the homework this week, you're going to listen to a podcast where we talk about electron microscopes. So I'll just go briefly through this uh, now since you're going to hear it in the podcast anyways. But electron microscopes are a modern invention. Before that, in the last maybe 300 years, I think it was the 17th century or so, we discovered uh, optical microscopes. These used visible light. 
So they use light and they use lenses, right? The lenses allows you to get magnification by, by condensing that light, right? Um, the problem is you can only see the surface of opaque materials. That's one problem with visible light in a microscope. You put a piece of metal on there, you can look at the surface of the metal, but you can't look through it, right? Another problem is that they typically have a really shallow depth of field, meaning, I don't know if you ever looked at this, but if you look at the surface of a penny under high magnification in a microscope, you might notice that it's really easy for it to go in and out of focus depending on where you choose your focus to be. You can see the top of Lincoln's head in focus, but the bottom might not be. Stuff like that, it has a really shallow depth of field that, that, that actually be in, that can be in focus. But optical microscopes can do some really cool things. For example, let's say you've got a material that has different grain boundaries, okay? Now, if it's got a grain boundary, you can etch the grain boundary. You see this here, this little divot they created in the material? They did that by etching, okay? And by etching it, what they're doing is they put it in a chemical treatment like an acid. If you put a material in an acid and it's gonna start dissolving it, well, the acid is gonna dissolve everywhere, but it's gonna dissolve some spots more than others. So let's go back to our picture here. Okay, if I put this thing in, in an acid bath, where is it going to choose to attack, right? It could remove this atom that atom right there could get removed, it could dissolve it, but it could also choose to get rid of this atom, right? So which one's gonna choose to get rid of? It's gonna choose to get rid of the one that is more energetically costly. And this one at these grain boundaries along here, they're more jammed together and they don't wanna, they're not in a perfect alignment. So if the acid's gonna dissolve anything, it's gonna dissolve these ones first. These ones are more reactive. They're more ready to break their bonds and leave the structure. So you see this when you actually when you etch things with an acid or thermally etch them that you tend to see the biggest divots forming along the grain boundaries so think what that does to incoming light so in comes your light it hits your material and it's going to bounce off and then that gets collected by the microscope but if it comes down right here near the edge it's going to bounce off at some weird angle that's not going to make it back to the microscope so in this case the way that they've drawn it here your etched grain boundary will show up darker to the visible eye because less light makes it back. And you can actually see this in microscope images. Yeah, sure enough. So take a look at this image over here. You've got um, here. You've got these dark regions. That's where the etching occurred. And so the light doesn't show up. They appear as black. And the reason that they're black is because that funny angle causes the light to deflect it funny. It doesn't go back through the lens, so you don't see it. So there's less light there. Now you'll also notice when you look at these that different grains can have different sort of contrast, right? Some of them, if it was a material like this, it might just look all the same. You might be able to see the grain boundaries if they were etched, but in some materials, they actually look like they're different materials. Some might be white, gray, or black. So what's happening there? What's happening there is that you've gotten your material different orientations of the lattice, right? It can be oriented in all sorts of different ways, and light coming in is gonna bounce off of those in different ways. For example, you can see it right here. If they're straight up and down, if this, if your orientation of your grains is like this, maybe they'll bounce off at a certain angle. But if they're oriented this way, more light will bounce off at a different angle. So the ones that bounce back the most will appear the brightest. Here's your medium, and here's your darkest, the ones that bounce back the least. So optical microscopy can actually do some pretty cool things. Um, now, the smallest resolution you can get out of an optical microscope, I mean, really pushing it, is like a few hundred nanometers. That's as small as you can get. But lots of the things that we care about are way smaller than that. I mean, we showed you pictures of atoms, right, up here with these microscopy images. Here you're seeing individual atoms. Those are tiny, right? Here's the scale bar, two nanometers, right? The distance between atoms is usually typically a couple angstroms. So this is a thousand times smaller, roughly, than what we're seeing, a little bit less even. So you need a microscope that's much more powerful. How are you gonna do that? One of the problems with um, visible light is that visible light goes between 390 and 700 nanometers. That's what we can see with our eyeball. So that's how big the wavelength is, right? That's how big the wave is. If you go from peak to peak, it's on the order of a few hundreds, hundreds of nanometer. Well, how are you ever gonna see something tiny like these little things, really, really small things, when the wave that you're using to look at them with is so much bigger. You're not gonna be able to see them, right? That's why we, knew, we use electron microscopes. 
Electron microscopes can shrink this wavelength to really, really small so that we can see them. You can go really small, definitely small enough to see atoms technically. This allows you to get higher magnification. Um, you can also focus the beam really, really small, which has some benefits, right? So there's the transmission electron microscope. In a transmission electron microscope, here's your sample. You have your beam of electrons and it passes through the sample, okay? The regions that absorb the electrons a little bit more will show up darker, that absorb them less will show up a little bit brighter, more electrons will get through, and so you get contrast. So if you look at this, you can see, sure enough, um, here's an example of, I don't know what the magnification is, but they're looking at graphite, and you can actually see the graphite atoms here, which is phenomenal, right? That's a 1.4 angstrom distance, right? 0.14 nanometers, and you can see these things, so amazing stuff. Um, you can also do things like diffraction. We're not going to cover that in this class, but instead of the electron beam passing right through, it actually gets diffracted. You see it splitting off at different angles, and you can measure those and do diffraction. Just like we did diffraction with x-rays, you can do electron beam diffraction as the beams pass through your sample, which lets you characterize the structure while you're also looking at it, which is really cool. Um, then there's scanning electron microscopes. So these are a nice intermediate between, they don't get the same resolution that a transmission electron microscope gets because they don't accelerate as high typically. So the, the wavelength is a little smaller of the, of the electrons. But they have really great properties, right? Take a look at these images that I collected years ago when I was uh, a technician at a local ceramics company one night when I was bored. I put some bugs in the SEM. And if you look at this, this is the eyeball of a fly. Take a look at this. You see dark regions and you see like bright regions. You see dark regions and you see bright regions. Or in other words, this kind of looks like a real picture. It, has, it looks like it has light and shadow, but there shouldn't be any light and shadow here, right? Because we're, look, we're visualizing this with electrons. Electrons come down into your material, they interact with the material, they bounce back, or they generate a secondary electron, and we collect those. And that's how we're visualizing these things, as you'll hear when you listen to the podcast. So how on earth do we get light and shadow? You want to listen to that, because that's one of the homework questions this week. Okay. One of the really cool things that you can do with um, scanning electron microscopes, well, with electron microscopes, is you can do elemental analysis. This was one of the first things we covered in this class. We talked about EDS, energy dispersive spectroscopy. If you remember that, that's you've got your nucleus, right? And then you've got these shells of electrons, right? And basically what's happening is if you come in with a really high powered electron and you knock this electron out, right? When it collides with it, one of these other electrons in the vicinity might choose to come down and occupy that now empty seat, right? And in doing so, it gives off that characteristic wavelength of X-ray. So it's going to give off that, let me write that correctly. It gives off an X-ray, and we can measure that. So then, all of a sudden, you can take a material like this. So here's the secondary image over here. You do regular X, uh, SEM imaging, and you can't see a lot there. But then you do backscatter imaging, and all of a sudden you can see this thing really clearly. It shows up bright and the other one dark. You can learn about that in the podcast, how backscatter imaging work. And then over here, you can do even better. You can say, all right, we're not just going to do secondary imaging. We're not just going to do backscatter. Now we're going to do elemental mapping. And you can see that, okay, here's sulfur. Sulfur is that particle, and it has a little bit of iron. So it's iron pyrite, maybe. It's FES, something, some sort of compound with both iron and sulfur. Whereas you look at oxygen, magnesium, they're definitely not present. There's no signal in that region. So this allows you to do really cool things in sort of forensic work and figuring out what's happening in your material. Is there a defect? If so, what does it look like? If so, you know, what's it made up of? And then you could do diffraction and try and figure out, okay, if there's three elements present in the material, then let's do diffraction and figure out what phases has those three elements and do they match. So it's a really cool tool for doing um, reverse engineering other products basically and figuring out what's going wrong with materials. Now another type of microscopy um, is scanning probe microscopy, something like atomic force microscopy, where literally you have a surface of a material, you have a little, uh, like a little uh, cantilever and you tap the surface. You either physically touch it or you measure when you get close, is there a change in the um, electric response, do, does it start to tunnel electrons, you can do all sorts of different ways, but they literally tap along an atom or a surface and you can visualize structures in much of the same way like you would as if you looked at it with the microscope. So for example, this molecule here, but it's tapping along it really carefully, they can actually visualize structures, which is amazing. They can get really, really high resolution with this 
and it generates these three-dimensional topographical maps of the surface of a material. Okay? Um, one thing that you should be aware of is that as engineers, it's common that you'll be expected to quantify a grain size, right? So you take a picture, whether that's in a scanning electron microscope or an optical, and you get this, right? And there's clearly a bunch of grains there, right? But it's common for people to ask, well, how big are these grains, right? So you would need a scale bar on here, and then you could sort of like guess a little bit, but there's a more appropriate way to do it. There's actually an American uh, Society of Testing Materials, right, the ASTM, that tells us the right way to go about testing this, and you can see an example of that um, in this YouTube video here. It's called the line intercept method. Basically, you draw lines across your sample, and you count how many times it intersects those lines, and there's a little formula that lets you calculate then what is the grain size by doing that approach. There's other approaches, but that's one of the more common ones. Okay, so that's uh, the lecture for today.